Good afternoon and good evening. We'd like to welcome hundreds of you joining us today from across many different time zones, many from California, the US West and the United States, and also many of you joining us internationally from as far away as Cape Town, South Africa, Bangalore, India, Manila in the Philippines and Melbourne, Australia. On behalf of the Pacific Institute, I'd like to welcome you to this live briefing for the new analysis released today, The Untapped Potential of California's Urban Water Supply. This report focuses on how urban water use can be substantially reduced across California through the implementation of water efficiency measures. It also assesses how local non-traditional water supplies can be substantially boosted through water reuse and stormwater capture. To introduce myself on the next slide, I'm Amanda Bielowski, Director of Communications and Outreach for the Pacific Institute. I will serve as your moderator for today's briefing. As you'll see on the next slide, we'd like to let you know that the full report, executive summary, and a related infographic are now available for download on our website, pacinst.org. We're also dropping links to those now in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We hope you'll take a moment during or following the briefing today to download these materials and consider sharing them with relevant stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd also like to share a bit of information about the Pacific Institute. The Pacific Institute is an independent, nonpartisan global water think tank. We were founded in 1987 and now have staff around the world. The Institute is a nonprofit organization and thanks the foundations, organizations, and individual contributors who support this critical water work. Recognizing that climate change is water change, I'd like to let you know that the Pacific Institute recently set a 2030 organizational goal to catalyze the transformation to water resilience. Much of the Pacific Institute's work, including the research being discussed during this briefing, support the realization of that water resilience goal. I'll also draw your attention quickly to the image on the right of your screen. If you're interested in learning more about water resilience, we encourage you to download the water resilience issue brief, which provides definitions, strategies, and goals. We'll drop a link to that document in the chat now. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our panelists for today's briefing. From left to right, Heather Cooley, Director of Research, Dr. Peter Glick, Senior Fellow and Co-Founder of the Pacific Institute, Dr. Sonali Abraham, Research Associate, Dr. Ann Thibault, Senior Researcher, and I'm your moderator, Amanda Bielowski. As you'll see on our next slide, our agenda for today starts with an overview of key findings and the report's relevance from Heather Cooley. We'll now move on to a context of climate change and drought. We'll then move on to taking a look at the potentials for the three individual strategies, water efficiency, water reuse, and stormwater capture. And we'll move on then to key findings and recommendations. And actually before that, take a look at best practice examples from across California. And then we're reserving a bit of time at the end of our session today for Q&A. Uh, and we invite you to submit your questions at the bottom of the screen in the Q&A function. Before we get started, as you'll see on the next slide, just a few brief announcements for today's briefing. First, this session is being recorded. All participants are automatically muted. We invite you to use the Q&A function in the bottom of your screen to submit questions to our experts here today. We'll be answering those during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. The slide deck and a recording of the briefing will be made available following this briefing. For many journalists with us today, welcome to you. We encourage you to reach out to us at media at pacinst.org to arrange an interview or receive more information or data sets following this briefing. And we invite all of you to join us live on Twitter, where the Pacific Institute will be live tweeting during the briefing. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague, Heather Cooley, Director of Research for the Pacific Institute, for an overview of the report's key findings and the relevance of those findings as California faces severe drought. Heather? Thank you, Amanda. And thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be able to present some of our key findings. 
We, we find that California has made laudable progress in recent years to reduce water use and develop local supplies. Without those efforts, our water challenges would, even be, would be even more severe. But more is needed in the face of intensifying drought and climate change. We find that efficient technologies and practices could reduce California's urban water use by two to 3.1 million acre feet per year or by 30% to 48%. This is above and beyond the improvements that we've already made. Reuse of municipal wastewater could boost local water supplies by 1.8 million to 2.1 million acre feet per year. This represents, this would represent a three, uh, a tripling of our, our recycled water potential. Urban stormwater capture in areas overlying public supply aquifers could boost water supplies by 580,000 acre feet in a dry year to 3 million acre feet in a wet year. These, prep, these strategies are proven, they're cost effective, and they can provide water reliability and other co-benefits for California. Co-benefits like reduced energy use and greenhouse gas emissions and environmental benefits as well. These findings are not only relevant for policy and decision-making in California, but they can inform policy and decision-making in the rest of the US and even in other parts of the world. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Peter Glick, who will be talking about California drought realities and climate change. Thank you, Heather. Uh, let me add my welcome to everyone here today. Uh, before we get to the details of the methods and the results of the report, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on where we are. Uh, as many people who are in the West already know, we're experiencing a severe drought, as the next slide will show. Uh, it's the third year of a severe drought. If you look at the graph on the far left, the water that is beginning our dry season in major California reservoirs is well below normal. Uh, we have less than half of the current storage capacity in our reservoirs because of the lack of rain and snow in the last three years. The middle graph shows that we started the year in December with a very wet, uh, a wet season, and then the storm window shut off. The snowpack stopped coming. The first three months of this year, January, February, March, are the driest three years in recorded history. And the snowpack that we did receive is now disappearing extremely rapidly. The map on the right shows the US Drought Monitor, a map that's prepared every week for the Western United States, for the US as a whole, showing that basically the entire Western United States is in drought at the moment. Uh, this severe drought is one of the reasons why we're doing this kind of assessment at this time to try and understand strategies for moving forward. Next slide. But we also know that this drought is not uh, in isolation, that climate change is already affecting Western water resources. This is a, a graph that shows from a report that came out in the last several weeks that the last 22 years in the southwestern part and the western part of North America are the driest in the last 1,200 years. And that report also highlighted, as many other reports, unfortunately, in the last two years have highlighted, that human-caused climate change is influencing the severity of the extreme events we're seeing in the western U.S. We know that climate change has worsened severe drought in California. We know that our water systems and planning do not adequately account for this yet. And the strategies that we've assessed in the new report, the improvements in efficiency and the expansion of supplies from recycled water and wastewater uh, and uh, stormwater capture can help build climate resilience in the face of the severe events we're now experiencing. In order to talk about some of the results, let me turn this over now to my colleague, Sonali Abraham, who's going to talk first about the efficiency results of the study. Sonali. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'll be talking about the urban water efficiency results, but I first wanted to start off by grounding ourselves in historical trends and where we're currently at in our water use. So in this chart on the left side, you see water use in million acre feet on the y-axis, and it shows historical trends in urban, agricultural, and total water use from 1960 right up to 2016. 
Um, we see by looking at the blue urban trend that water use peaked in 2007, but then we saw a pretty dramatic decline after that. In 2007, it was close to 10 million. And now, according to our estimates, it is only 6.6 .6 million acre feet, showing um, you know, we've made a lot of progress in the past years. Um, on the right side, you'll see a spatial representation of urban and residential um, water use. Uh, per capita. So st statewide urban per capita use is 152. And then residential per capita water use is 94 GPCD. Um, what we see when we look at these trends is that generally water use tends to get higher when you move from north to south, as well as from west to east, reflecting, you know, the climate drives a lot of our water use, particularly the um, drier, hotter areas tend to be higher. Um, and I will move on into some of the methods for our for our study. Um, so we used uh, we estimated urban water efficiency potential using the state board's electronic annual reports. Um, we used a uh, average across 2017, 18, and 19 to represent quote unquote um, a normal year, and then we developed two scenarios for each sector. So this was a moderate efficiency scenario and a high efficiency scenario. Our moderate efficiency scenario is based on full comp compliance with current standards. So how much um, water could we you know, save or use if everyone was meeting current standards? And then our high efficiency scenario goes beyond current standards. So you know, for, for example, for indoor appliances, this is the best available technology out there. So often they use less water than is currently mandated. For landscape conversions, it's complete conversion to climate appropriate plants. Um, sorry, next slide, please. So moving on to some results. Um, so first off, in our we're looking here at water efficiency potential by sector. To start off to highlight, our statewide potential is 2 million to 3.1 million acre feet per year. And in this chart, what you'll see is you know, the x-axis is our sector-specific results, and then our y-axis is the water efficiency potential in million acre feet per year. The blue bar shows our high efficiency scenario and the gray bar shows the moderate efficiency scenario. Um, so what is clear here is first off that the residential sector has a lot of potential, the most potential. Um, and outdoor, as expected, I'm sure this is not surprising to most people, has the most potential. Lots of, lots of changes that can be, met, can be made there. Um, however, interestingly, indoor comes in a close second so lots of lots of things that can be done there. I also want to draw attention to the CII sector. While it may not seem like much here, it is. There's a lot of low hanging fruit that can still be explored in the CII sector, both indoor and outdoor. Um, and the next slide will show our results by region. Um, there's a lot happening in this chart, so I just want to focus your attention to the fact that we've, you know, on the y-axis you can see the ten hydrologic regions, and so we've looked at results by. Uh, region by across these 10 regions across the state. And then on the x-axis, you see the water potential um, in million acre feet per year. The light blue bar shows you the indoor potential. This is residential and commercial together. The uh, dark blue bar shows you the outdoor potential. And then the gray little gray bar at the end shows you the non-revenue water. And then we have high and moderate. So what you see is that we have a lot of potential across the state. Every region has urban efficiency potential. Um, and you also see that the South Coast has the most. It has about 50% of the state savings can be accrued in the South Coast. Um, there's also a lot of variation across the state to be noted. Um, I will stop there and hand over to my colleague, Dr. Ann Thiebaud, who's going to take us through the results for both water reuse um, and then stormwater capture. Ann, over to you. Great. Thanks, Sonali. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, so I want to start by uh, talking a little bit about kind of where we've come in terms of recycled water in California. And so over the last 50 years, we've more than tripled the amount of recycled water that we use. And so we currently use about 728,000 uh, acre feet per year. And the pie chart, um, the pie chart on, this, on this slide shows kind of how recycled water gets used across the state. And from that, we can see that you know, irrigation uses, particularly agricultural irrigation, landscape irrigation, uh, but also industrial applications and groundwater recharge are some of the major categories of uh, water reuse that are occurring in the state. Um, but the other takeaway from this, when we look at the breadth of uses of recycled water across the state, it also provides some insights into the multitude of co-benefits 
um, that these types of projects provide, um, provide across the state and communities. Next slide, please. So to estimate water use potential, um, really this work was really possible because of the State Water Resources Control Board's uh, volumetric annual reporting data. So this is a, just really just an amazing resource for this type of work. Um, so we started out by looking at the total municipal wastewater production, and we separated out what's currently being reused and what's not currently reused. Um, and then we looked at uh, where is that water going? Because you know, where that water is being discharged has really big impacts on you know, on the ease with which that water can potentially be reused. So water that's going to say land discharge or marine environments, um, you know, that water has a lot of potential for reuse and it is a really high priority um, across the state for, um, for future reuse projects. Um, water that goes to inland surface waters is a little bit more complicated. Um, so there's about 250,000 acre feet that's reserved for in-stream flows and natural systems. And that water is already providing a lot of ecological benefits and things like that is not available for um, future reuse projects. Um, however, there's another 250,000 acre feet that's not formally reserved for in-stream flows and natural systems. And this is, this is um, you know, this tranche of water, it really has to be evaluated on kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and between those two scenarios, you know, we found the potential for reuse across the whole state to be somewhere in the range of 1.8 to 2.1 million acre feet, which I'll dive into a little bit more on the next slide. So this is where it starts to get really interesting is when we start looking at, um, at the water use potential and how it varies across the state. Um, so just as a reminder, so roughly 24% of uh, municipal wastewater in the state is currently reused. And when we look at this figure, there's a couple of things that stick out. So of the roughly 2 million acre feet that's potentially available for reuse, roughly 1 million acre feet occurs in the South Coast region. And then there's about another 500,000 or so acre feet that occurs in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, however, that still leaves another 500,000 acre feet that's kind of distributed um, across the state, including in a lot of, in a lot of inland regions. Um, and when we think about that, you know, we think back to the current uses of recycled water in the state, we remember that agricultural water reuse, groundwater recharge, you know, things like that are, you know, our major current uses. And, you know, when we think about a lot of the inland regions, these are really major challenges um, in these regions. So we see, you know, there's a lot of potential benefits um, associated with water reuse for all sizes of communities. Um, I have the other really interesting um, thing that stood out in the regional analysis as well is the Sacramento River region. Um, in the Sacramento River region, you know, there's a lot of water um, that, that is providing uh, ecological benefits, um, protecting in stream flows, um, supporting wildlife refuges and things like that. And, you know, when we're thinking about the potential for water reuse, it's really important to think about the full range of, you know, existing direct and indirect uses of, of that effluent um, as we're planning these projects out. Um, and so with that, um, I think I'm going to switch gears and um, I want to share some work from my colleague Morgan Sh Shimabuku um, looking at estimating stormwater capture potential. And so these kind of go hand, in, you know, all these, all these strategies really kind of go hand in hand. Um, but one of the big, big motivations for stormwater capture potential is that, you know, there's not really a comprehensive estimate of existing stormwater capture volumes across the state. And so, you know, and there's a real need to understand, you know, what is the potential um, for the supply? So in this study, we developed statewide estimates. Um, so we looked at runoff from impervious surface cover in urban areas across the state. Um, that's in areas that are overlying public supply, supply aquifers. So that's kind of how we defined, um, you know, capturable stormwater. Um, and we also looked at three different precipitation scenarios a high, medium, and low uh, historical precipitation scenarios. Um, next slide, please. And when we look at stormwater capture potential by region, um, you know, we saw the range, you know, it, the range really varies um, based on the amount of precipitation that occurs. And so in any given year, you know, ranging from roughly 580,000 to, to 3 million acre feet. Um, and with the largest potential occurring in the South Coast region. Um, and this is largely due to, you know, there's a lot of impervious surface in that, in that area, so a lot of runoff. Um, and so, you know, 
there's a lot of potential for stormwater capture across um, across the region, and um, and there's a lot of great examples of of those types of projects occurring. And so, with that, I believe I'll be turning it back over to my colleague, Heather Cooley. Thank you, Anne. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about how the strategies compare with each other, um, and, and I'll provide also some examples. This figure is showing the potential for each of the three strategies in the 10 hydrologic regions across the state. The gray bar is showing the water reuse potential. In blue is the stormwater potential in areas overlying public supply aquifers. And in green, uh, we have the efficiency potential. The opportunities in each of the hydrologic regions, as you can see, varies. Um, it varies based upon past efficiency improvements on water reuse investments that have, have already been made. It varies based on land use and on population. Um, but what we do see in six of the 10 hydrologic regions, water efficiency provides the greatest potential. Um, but in the San Francisco Bay, we see that uh, water reuse the water reuse potential is at the greatest there. Um, in this area, there's about 9% of the wastewater that's generated that's currently reused. And as my colleague Anne discussed, there's about a 500,000 uh, acre feet potential there. Um, if we look in areas like the Sacramento River and the North Coast and Central Coast hydrologic regions, we really see where um, the greatest potential lies with stormwater capture. I want to highlight a few key points um, with respect to the analysis. First, I want to really relay that the potentials we quantified are not additive across the three strategies, but they are complementary. So we can't simply add up the water efficiency and the reuse and the storm water capture to get a total potential. Just as an example of that, as we improve our indoor efficiency, we're generating less water. That would then mean less water reuse, less wastewater is available for water reuse. So for that reason, they're not additive. But as I noted, they're complementary in that these strategies can work together to help make our communities more resilient to climate change. I also want to highlight that this is a snapshot of current opportunities. So we did not evaluate any new technologies that aren't yet available or, or available in the market. We didn't try to look at changes in population or in economic activity or any sort of new development. Obviously, all of those factors would change um, the, the potential in each, for each of these strategies. So it's, again, really a snapshot of what are the opportunities now um, with our existing economic activities, population, technologies, et cetera. We also did not quantify opportunities for agriculture. Um, we recognize though that they're significant. There's a lot of uh, uh, potential that's been realized in agriculture. Uh, there have been changes in irrigation technology, for example, um, in irrigation methods, um, and there's more opportunity there. But for this study, we were really focused on our urban areas. A key question um, that we often get and that many are probably wondering is what do these strategies cost and how do they compare with other uh, supply or, or efficiency options? This figure is from work that we did several years ago looking at the cost on a dollar per acre foot basis for efficiency measures and for various water supply options. I will highlight, and, and these were based on actual projects that were either developed or in, or in some cases under uh, proposed. Um, I will note that costs are site specific. There's a lot of variability as indicated by the width of each of the bars. Um, but across the strategies, what we see is that efficiency is the, among the most cost effective, uh, followed by stormwater capture and reuse. Um, and we see that these three strategies, though, are far less expensive than, for example, seawater desalination or for other more traditional options um, where they're even available. I also want to highlight um, on this graph, as is shown, many efficiency measures have a negative cost. Um, what that means is that the, the savings over the life of the efficiency measure are greater than the incremental cost of the more efficient device. So the energy savings, for example, or the reductions in, in, in a wastewater bill. Again, those, those savings exceed the cost and is why they show up here 
as a negative cost. I also want to note that these st strategies provide co-benefits that can make them even more economically viable. Efficiency, for example, can save energy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, landscape efficiency improvements can also reduce polluted runoff, which has water quality benefits. We can look at uh, water reuse. As my colleague Ann mentioned, there are multiple benefits for water reuse. Um, of course, it can augment our supplies, but it can also reduce the discharge of wastewater into our oceans, improving the quality um, and reducing pollution there. Likewise, stormwater capture uh, can improve water quality, reduce flood risk, obviously augment supplies as we looked at here, but they can also, depending on the strategy, um, provide recreational space, provide community benefits. So there are many co-benefits associated with each of these strategies um, that can then increase the potential for partnerships and collaboration and make them even more economically viable. We see a number of examples of these types of strategies across California. Um, for example, in San Francisco in 2009, uh, they uh, adopted a retrofit on resale ordinance. This ordinance requires high efficiency plumbing in single and multifamily homes upon resale. And they project that this program will save over two and a half billion gallons by 2045. In Long Beach, there is a pilot program where they are providing single family homeowners in low income neighborhoods with a free sustainable landscape. This is an important uh, pilot project um, and, can, and can serve as a model for others. We also see many examples of water reuse projects across the state. Uh, the Pure Water Monterey project, for example, is not only treating municipal wastewater, it also treats industrial process water, irrigation drainage, uh, and urban stormwater, and uses that water for groundwater. It's an important project uh, in particular for that region. Uh, in Southern California, the Metropolitan Water District um, is proposing to build a 150 million gallon recycled water project. Um, they are looking to partner with many agencies, including in Nevada and Arizona, and that could lead to those agencies co-funding construction and operation of that project in exchange for Colorado River water. A really interesting and innovative examples of the potential for partnerships and collaborations within California and even outside of California. There are a number of stormwater capture projects, again, across California. Uh, in Fresno, for example, uh, there are more than 150 stormwater retention basins in the Fresno Clovis area. These basins are not only reducing flooding and improving water quality, um, but also replenishing groundwater and an important uh, water source for that community. And in San Francisco, the Moscone Center Expansion Project, um, this is a project that was required under San Francisco's ordinance requiring on-site water systems for large new developments. Um, but this is a district scale on-site water system that's treating and reusing rainwater, condensate from the building's cooling system and foundation drainage. That project offsets about 15 million gallons per year of potable water. Um, it uses that water for toilet, flushing, <laughs> uh, for landscape irrigation, and even for refilling trucks that are used for street cleaning throughout San Francisco. There are a number of projects of these sort of on-site systems in San Francisco, and then we're seeing them in other places as well. So to summarize, um, we have found tremendous progress in recent years um, to reduce water use. We're using less water today um, than we did 15 years ago. Um, we've, uh, we've developed local supplies like recycled water and storm water. These have been tremendously important and we've seen uh, success from these. We can build on that sex. We must build on that success in the face of intensifying drought and climate change. The good news is that we find that efficient technologies and practices could reduce California's urban water use by an additional 2 million to 3.1 million acre feet, which represents a 30 to 48% reduction in urban water use. The reuse of municipal wastewater could boost local water supplies 
by 1.8 million to 2.1 million acre feet. If we build this capacity, it would in effect triple our current recycled water use in California. Urban stormwater capture in areas overlying public supply aquifers could boost local water supplies by as little as 580,000 acre feet in a dry year, up to 3 million acre feet in a wet year. We find that these strategies are proven, they're cost effective, and they can provide water reliability and other co-benefits for California. Quantifying the potential is, a, is an important step. It helps us think about how do we prioritize our efforts, but it's also important to think about how do we realize this potential. The new study provides a number of recommendations for helping to uh, realize that potential, and I'll highlight just a few for each of the strategies here. First, with respect to water use efficiency and water loss control. We have tremendous opportunity and need to increase funding for water efficiency and water loss to levels consistent with other water supply investments. We are not currently investing in water efficiency to the levels we are in others and increasing those investments would realize tremendous potential water savings. We can also look to new ordinances, things like banning non-functional grass at businesses and institutions and in large housing developments. Uh, Nevada has already taken this important step and we can follow their lead. We can also adopt retrofit on resale ordinances like San Francisco has done and other communities in California. They can be for residential and even for non-residential properties. This can help us get at the old appliances and fixtures that are in the existing housing stock. And importantly, we must make efficiency and programs accessible to low income and multifamily households. Um, the benefits of these programs are there and we must ensure that all can, can access those benefits. With respect to recycle water, here too, there is much we can do to try to realize the potential. We have a tremendous opportunity with the new, invest, the new federal investments in water systems. We can be leveraging state and federal funding for recycled water and prioritizing multi-benefit projects. We must continue progress on regulations for direct potable reuse and on-site non-potable water systems. We need every tool in, in the toolbox um, to be able to really realize this potential and help build our resilience. We also can regularly evaluate and, re and revise our regulatory frameworks as our technologies improve, as our comfort and experience with operating these, these systems improve. And finally, as we think about our recycled water investments, it's important that we right-size those investments. We must incorporate the efficiency improvements that are going to be realized as a result of our standards and codes, we also must look at changes in population and economic activity and land use as we're developing local and regional assessments of both the supply and demand for recycled water. Again, these are important investments and we need to, be make, to make sure we are right-sizing those investments. There is much we can and must do to realize the stormwater capture potential as well. It's important that we reduce the barriers to fund, for funding for ongoing operation and maintenance costs. This will help to ensure that when we build the projects, that the benefits, uh, the water supply benefits are realized and are maintained um, as expected. We can also, because stormwater is a multi-benefit project, we can be creating partnerships to bring in all of those entities that are benefiting to provide additional incentives um, for, for stormwater projects on residential and even for non-residential properties. And finally, we can be developing stormwater capture goals for the state based on our quantitative assessment of the potential and then tracking progress towards these goals. Um, this will be important for realizing and understanding where we have had success where we have had setbacks and any changes we must, we must make in order to realize the full potential. So I'd like to thank uh, my project, the project team. I've it's been a fabulous team to work with. I'd also like to thank our communications team. Um, 
we really couldn't have done it, done this work without you. I'd also like to thank um, our, our supporters of this work, the Emigrant Trails Greenway Trust, as well as Environment Now. We thank them for their generous support in making this work possible. I'd now like to hand it over uh, to Amanda who will moderate the Q&A session. Thank you, Heather, and thanks for all the excellent presentations from the whole panel. We also thank you for sharing your questions in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to do so, so that we can uh, share your questions with panelists during the next few minutes. With that, I'll invite our panelists to join us back again on screen, and I will start sharing questions that we're receiving from our attendees today. The first question is such an apt question um, and really gets at the heart of this work. The question is, how should municipalities go about determining which one of these strategies or all three of these strategies is the best for them to pursue? Heather, maybe I'll, I'll share that with you and you can um, pull in colleagues uh, as you see fit. Great. Well, I think one of the key, uh, so the, the strategies available in any, for any municipality, for any community will vary. So it is important to sort of look at them individually. I think doing a quantitative assessment of similar to what we did, the statewide assessment, what are the opportunities for efficiency and reuse and stormwater capture? Understanding what those potential and opportunities are for your community based on local land use, based on past efficiency improvements and current water use is very critical. And then two, looking at the, the economics, what do these things cost and how do they compare? I, I would urge particularly when we look at the economics, um, particularly around um, efficiency, but for all the strategies to really think about the co-benefits that they can provide. Um, though that not only of, of course, with respect to water supply, water quality, community livability, flood risk, energy savings, et cetera, that can help us to identify who else might be supportive of these projects and who else might be able to contribute towards building, building these or installing these in the case of efficiency. I'd invite any of my colleagues to sort of jump in if they'd like to add on to that. All right, thanks, Heather. Our next question has to do with the efficiency scenarios that were presented today. So Sonali, uh, you might want to jump in on this one. Uh, you discussed moderate and high efficiency scenarios. And the question has to do with whether the analysis calculated the financial investments that would be needed to reach both the moderate and the high efficiency scenario. Um, Short answer, no, we did not look at the financial implications of both these things. We're very aware that this, you know, both the moderate and high efficiency scenarios are really intended to be sort of snapshots into what, what is possible. Um, and as Heather presented, you know, we have done previous work around financial implications and the cost effectiveness of these strategies. And we know for a fact that they are cost effective. Um, but yeah, we did not calculate that specifically here. I would I'll hand over to Heather to see if she has anything to add there. Thank you, Sonali. Um, uh, I, I would also just add, in addition to that, and note that the cost really depends on how we implement these things. So um, if it's done through standards and codes, or if it's done through ordinances, the cost of that would look different than if it's done through a rebate program, for example. So um, as was mentioned, when we've looked at you know, efficiency programs in particular, we found them to be very cost effective. If you look over the life of the device and considers all of the co-benefits and the reductions in operation and maintenance costs associated with them. Um, but, but again, I, you know, I, 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 think, I think it just really depends on how we implement them. And I, I, I think there's lots of opportunities um, to be looking at, at ordinances, um, and incentives and education, uh, lots of different strategies for helping to realize the opportunities. Our next question has to do with lawns, um, a, a very popular question uh, today. The question is, I live in an HOA that tends to ignore the water challenge at hand. They feel we should all have green lush front lawns and medians. What can be done to help resolve this? This applies to a number of strategies, so I'll share it with all of you to consider a response. I'll jump in, but I'll let others kind of kind of uh, <laughs> jump in there too. Um, you know, I, I think 
lawns uh, are very water intensive, as we know. They're also water quality. You know, the, they use a lot of pesticides and fertilizers. They create downstream sort of water quality issues. There are many utilities that are now providing incentives to try to encourage people. I think we're also seeing the broader social change um, where, you know, the de facto standard for many is not now a lawn. Where we have lots of opportunities for these uh, multi-benefit, water efficient landscapes. Um, I, you know, I do think uh, we can support this in, in terms of local ordinances that, that are requiring uh, these alternative sort of landscapes. I think there's an education component that's needed. Um, I think, you know, there, there are a lot we, we must do, I think, to sort of change the culture um, for California landscapes so that we are moving towards those that are far more sustainable um, and resilient. Thanks, Heather. Our next question has to do with uh, the economic and equity aspects of the strategies that are suggested. We know that California has a human right to water. Uh, we know yet that there are significant water equity issues across the state. The question really wants to ask, um, how, do, how do these three strategies potentially help us address water equity issues in California? And maybe I'll, I'll turn that one to Peter to start. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, all three strategies can help deal with the shortfalls of water that we're facing now. Uh, the equity issues have to be addressed explicitly. And we talk about these in the report to some degree. Uh, we talked about them a little bit during the presentation. A lot of the progress we've already made, for example, in improving water use efficiency has been in single family homes. It hasn't been in multifamily homes. Uh, the upfront money for some of these improvements is not available to low-income communities. Uh, we need to think about strategies in each of the three areas for efficiency, for stormwater capture, for, for wastewater reuse that explicitly targets some of those disadvantaged and frontline communities that have, have been left out of some of the advances we've seen in the last several decades. That's again going to require probably both statewide action, uh, but also local actions. Um, I, I'm not sure if any of my colleagues want to, want to add to that. No, I think it's, a, I'll just add, uh, it's, it's a great question um, and a really important issue and topic. Um, you know, as we, we provided in one of the best practice examples, we see, for example, in Long Beach where they're piloting a program that's explicitly designed to make sure that low-income households can benefit um, from a direct install garden program. So I, I, you know, I think we need to see more of those. And I agree with Peter, you know, it's a common, it can be a combination of sort of federal incentives for this state and then local incentives. I, I think it's going to be critical to making sure that all communities can benefit from these strategies. Let me add one more thing about that. We've done this in the past. We've thought about some of these issues in the past. And there's some interesting examples from California's long water history. Uh, when we were trying to figure out how to save the ecosystem in Mono Lake, for example, which would require Los Angeles to cut some of its water extractions from that Mono Basin. Uh, we developed a program with the Mothers of East LA to explicitly target low-income communities that couldn't afford the upfront costs to replace inefficient toilets and washing machines and dishwashers. And those programs in those low-income communities provided the income, provided the the upfront costs and saved enough water to reduce the extractions from Mono Lake. We can develop these kinds of targeted programs today and we ought to be putting more effort in that area. I would also add that there was a job training component for that program as well. So, um, you know, I think when we're intentional about these uh, these issues, we can, we can make a lot of progress. So, uh, you know, there's lots of opportunities there particularly, you know, we, we will need to make investments. I think, I think that is, is very clear in terms of building our resilience uh, to climate change. And so if we're intentional about how we make those investments, we can be supporting job opportunities in communities that, that need them. 
Thank you both. Another question that we're receiving uh, with great frequency this morning has to do with agriculture. Of course, uh, accounting for about 80% of water use, uh, these findings relate specifically to urban water solutions. So the question for all of you as panelists is, what about uh, urban water use? And is there a future study planned perhaps that would look at similar issues, but in the agricultural sense? Yeah, so let, let me tackle that. Um, we know, of course, that agriculture is a huge component of California's water use. Eighty percent of the water that humans use in California goes to agriculture. Uh, this particular study focused on urban water use. We've done previous studies on agricultural potential as well, and, and we hope to do another study on agriculture. Uh, urban and agricultural water use is different. Uh, you know, we pay much more for high valued, high quality water in the urban centers, so we're often able to pay more to implement some of these programs on efficiency and reuse. Uh, but we also know that there's tremendous potential, and Heather mentioned this in the presentation, uh, in the agricultural sector to change cropping patterns, to change irrigation technology, to change land use, uh, to change scheduling, to change soil moisture monitoring in the agricultural sector. So we acknowledge, of course, the enormous potential. This report focused on, on the urban sector, but, but don't take that to mean that we don't understand uh, and don't also need to implement policies to address agricultural water use. All right, with that, I think Anne will toss it over to you with a question about water recycling and stormwater capture. The question is, how can we encourage discussions for potential collaboration on regional projects around both water recycling and stormwater capture, especially for smaller agencies with smaller budgets? Yeah, I think I think that's a great question. And there's a, a couple of big things um, wrapped up in there. And so I think Heather highlighted the example from uh, Monterey One Water, which is a, which is just such a fantastic example um, because it's a it's a it's an integrated project that incorporates uh, both municipal wastewater, uh, stormwater capture, water from the agricultural processing facilities, irrigation drainage water. And I think, you know, I think it's a great model for kind of how we need to be thinking about water, you know, thinking about all these potential sources. So it's not, it's really not an either or type of question. It's a, you know, what is our local context? What are the resources that are available to us? How are they being used currently, you know, and where is their potential? Um, and so, and particularly for, um, you know, small to medium sized communities, you know, in a lot of these communities, you know, the volumes on the reuse front, you know, the volume of municipal wastewater we're talking about might be relatively small, um, but there, you know, it may be located in an agricultural region where there's, um, you know, there's irrigation drainage water that could be, you know, could be integrated into the mix to kind of amplify that supply or agricultural processing facilities, CAFOs, you know, a host of different, you know, different things. So, you know, I think it behooves us to really think creatively about, you know, our local context and, you know, what our needs are, what the demands are and things like that. Because, you know, a big part of this too is making, matching the quality of the water to the needs of the local community. Um, you know, and so that's a big piece in terms of making these projects economically feasible for different sizes of communities as well. So I don't know if anyone has anything to add as well. Well, I'll just add, I, I just think the, the future for California water ne needs to be about collaboration and, and partnerships. Um, there are exa good examples um, across the state, and, and we really need to do more and, and better. Um, you know, the state historically has provided some incentives for that. I think we could be doing more there. I, I think we also need to put our heads together collectively um, and, and come up with solutions. I mean, there's lots of barriers to partnerships and collaboration. I mean, we could, you know, go on and on about that. Uh, but, I, but there are a lot of you know, fabulous examples in, in, in the cases we, you know, we talked about Monterey, Pure Water is a great example, even the, the proposed project in Southern California, um, which is which is urban agencies, it's larger urban agencies, but even there we see lots of opportunities for, for greater collaboration. And as we particularly think about these projects that are multi-benefit, 
they it has to have that collaboration. Otherwise, there's this one really one entity that's sort of bearing the cost. Um, and and it you know that's that's a it's unfair and it's going to slow projects and even eliminate projects. So by bringing in more partners, collaborators, we're bringing in support, we're potentially even bringing in more funding to bear um, that'll enable us to to move forward with these projects. Thank you, Anne and Heather. Heather, this next question is for you. You mentioned during the presentation the range of co-benefits that come along with these three strategies. Uh, one of them is a, you know, reducing the reliance on imported water. You also mentioned reducing energy use and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. One related question has to do with uh, someone writes, I read that one of the largest uses of energy in California is water transport. Is this true? And so potentially a follow up question would be, could you explain how these strategies reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the end? Great, great question. Ha happy to jump in and invite any of my colleagues to jump in as well. Um, water management in California is very energy intensive. And, and part of that is the movement and treatment of water. We move water long distances and over steep ter terrain. Um, but the greatest use of energy is in, is in heating water or in treating water in homes and in businesses across the state. Um, that's, that's the vast majority of it. Um, and as we reduce our water use, we're reducing the amount of water that we're moving treating, um, distributing, heating, and then treating again as wastewater. Um, we've, we did some work last year uh, with Next 10, looking at projections of future water use um, and, and the associated energy and greenhouse gas emissions um, and found that water efficiency is going is critical for helping us not only meet our water goals in California, but our energy and our climate goals. Um, so it's critical. It's also critical, I would say, as we look at the cost effectiveness, um, it's often the energy savings um, from water efficiency measures that make them cost effective. And it, as you recall, I showed the, the figure that showed the negative cost <laughs> um, for many water efficiency measures. That's large largely driven by the energy savings um, the, and, the, and the energy bill savings that result from those. So, so let me add to that. Uh, this question is also relevant for the questions we've been getting about the importance of local decision making and local evaluation of these projects. Uh, the energy cost of pumping water over the Tehachapi Mountains into the Los Angeles Basin, for example, is very high. Uh, and so saving a gallon of water from an energy perspective in the South Basin area may provide more energy and greenhouse gas benefits than saving it in an area that gets local water delivery uh, from, from gravity. So looking at the energy requirements to move water from different parts of the state to other parts of the state uh, is an important component in evaluating the local benefits and costs of particular strategies that we might choose to implement. Thank you, Heather and Peter. Our next question starts with efficiency. Uh, so Sonali, I'll share this with you to start. The question is, can we conclude that water efficiency is the primary strategy here, although the three different strategies showed are all complementary? I, I think I'm, I would not say it's the primary strategy. I think, what, I think we want to be very clear that all these three strategies are important. They have different um, levels of exploring that still need to be done. Efficiency, while we know has a lot of potential, can still be, you know, there's a lot that can be done to kind of promote uptake from, from the top. Um, so I would, yes, there's a lot of potential still to be explored with efficiency. Um, similarly with stormwater capture, it's there's so much left to sort of discover with stormwater capture that I think even, you know, we, we, we don't know the current estimate of what stormwater capture is right now, which means that we don't, we don't actually even know what that bump is so it, it I wouldn't say it's the primary strategy but it is the one with the most potential right now I think working on sort of all these strategies in conjunction with each other and understanding that they you know they talk to each other the, the benefits are amplified when we work when we do them together where we do them understanding that some places have you know higher efficiency potential and some places have better you know stormwater is a better strategy depending on those conditions and um yeah, so I think understanding local context, again, going to what Peter said, and but overall, yeah, the efficiency potential is is the highest, but understanding that these three strategies talk to each other, and it's really important to work on them uh, simultaneously. I'm sure Heather and Peter have something to add there. <laughs> can, 
Can I make one more point about that? Uh, what what Sonali said is, is absolutely correct. Let me just add also, though, we didn't talk about this much, but there's a short term and a long term difference here in some of these strategies. Building a smart stormwater capture system or a large scale urban water reuse system uh, requires significant investment and often significant time. Some of the water efficiency strategies can be implemented very quickly. Some of them are very short term changes in behavior, which we didn't quantify, but that are possible things that we do during severe droughts that, that frankly we ought to be doing now. Uh, but they're also, it's fairly quick to replace inefficient appliances, to uh, replace landscapes. So there are some short term and long term differences as well, as well that, that do tend to point toward water efficiency improvements in the short run as something that we can do relatively quickly. And so we have to think about the time factor involved in implementing these strategies. I would also just add on and, and say, you know, there is no single solution to our water challenges. Um, there are opportunities across each of these strategies. And, and, and it's, as I noted, and I will reiterate, they, these strategies are complementary. Um, we're going to be needing to do all of these things, maybe to varying degrees and at varying times, um, but to really solve our challenges. Um, we're faced with a much more variable and uncertain future. Um, droughts are intensifying. Uh, and so we need to be thinking about the range of strategies to, to help us get there. Um, I do think though, and we didn't evaluate this in the report, but I do think it's an important important to note, as we are thinking in particular about some of our supply investments, to be thinking about more modular and flexible investments. Um, you know, we've historically done very large projects. It's helped to, to keep the cost lower, at least on a dollar per acre foot basis, but there's a lot of risk associated with that. And so if we're taking sort of smaller, modular, more flexible approaches, um, that'll enable us to deal with this greater variable and uncertainty that we are now facing. Thank you, Heather. We have time for one last question. And Heather, I'll send this one back to you maybe for about a 60 second response so we can uh, end on time today. Uh, the question has to do with uh, the, 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 where the data come from. So the data discussed today are from California, but we know that California is just one of hundreds of regions around the world grappling with drought intensifying due to climate change. So the question is, can you talk in about 60 seconds about how this research discussed today may actually be applied to thinking not only in California, but in other areas of the world facing very similar scenarios? Yes, ha happy to touch on that. Um, so as, as you noted, uh, and as we talked about, this was based upon data and information for California. Um, and, and I have to thank those who have been working to make that data and information more readily available. This, this, is, this is hugely beneficial and important for these types of analysis. I will say though, that the strategies we looked at, opportunities to repair leaks, to take out old and efficient appliances and fixtures, um, to, to put in climate appropriate landscapes are strategies that work in every community. Um, you know, similarly, opportunities around reuse for a variety of different purposes or in ca capturing stormwater. Um, those types of strategies are things we can and must be doing in, in communities across, across the world. The importance, the relative importance of them may vary, um, but again, they work, they're effective, you know, there are lots of lessons we are learning here and, and, they, and, and that we can learn from other places that have implemented. Thank you, Heather. Given the time, we now need to wrap up the Q&A session. Thank you again for the questions you have submitted and thank you to our panelists today for this discussion. As you'll see on the next slide, uh, the slides from today's presentation and the recording will be available soon. We invite you to download the full report, the executive summary, and a related infographic that you see on the right of your screen exploring this new analysis. All of this is available at the Pacific Institute website at pacinst.org. As I mentioned earlier, the Pacific Institute is a nonprofit organization. This and other critical water work is made possible by funding from foundations, organizations, and individual contributors. We thank them. To learn more about how you can support the Pacific Institute's work, please visit us online at our website. And for those of you who have more questions, please send those along to us at info at pacinst.org. 
For the journalists with us today, thanks so much for joining us. Please reach out at media at pacinst.org to arrange interviews or to receive data sets and more information about regional projects. We invite you to continue the conversation and follow the Pacific Institute on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us today.